Notice the difference there. Hermione assumes that because Lockhart says he did these things in all of his books, then he must have really done them. Ron says, uh, he says he's done them. Drawing a distinction between the reality of a situation and what one thinks about a situation or the way a situation is portrayed. So we get to chapter Mudbloods and Murmurs, and Harry Egg's going to have his first Quidditch practice of the year. Oliver Wood gets them up early. He goes over theory and such for a couple of hours. And then they get ready to take the pitch. And they see the Slytherin team coming onto the field. And Oliver Wood is beside himself with anger because he's booked the field. Page 111, Marcus Flint shows Wood the note from Snape saying that they have permission to practice on the field. And then they see all of the Slytherin teams, new Nimbus 2001 broomsticks, which Malfoy's father bought for them. And on page 112, we hear Malfoy say some things about the Gryffindors, and the Slytherins laugh, and then Hermione says, at least no, at least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their way in. They got in on pure talent. We're told the smug look on Malfoy's face flickered. No one asked your opinion, you filthy little mudblood. He calls her that term, filthy little mudblood, and all hell breaks loose. He hears Ron say, how dare you, plunging his wand and his hand into his wand, into his robe and pulling out his wand, and yelling, you'll pay for that one, Malfoy. Seeing Fred and George uh, jumping on Malfoy and such. And so Ron curses Malfoy, but because his wand broke when they crashed into the Whomping Willow, Ron had the wand poured, pointed backwards, and he cursed himself. So they take him to Hagrid, and they talk a little bit about Gilderoy Lockhart, page 115, and Hagrid explains he was the only person for the job, that Dumbledore's been having a hard time filling the position. And then Ron explains what Malfoy had called Hermione. And Hagrid says, he didn't. Hermione, he did, but I don't know what it means. Now, keep in mind, Hermione doesn't read books about slang or colloquial speech or things like that. She, re she reads textbooks. She reads history books. Okay? Not being raised in the wizarding world, she wouldn't know what the slang terms mean. And so Ron explains what mudblood means. It's about the most insulting thing he could think of. Mudblood's a really foul name for someone who is muggle-born. You know, non-magic parents. There are some wizards, like Malfoy's family, who think they're better than everyone else because they're what people call pure blood. I, I mean, the rest of us know it doesn't make any difference at all. Look at Neville Longbottom. He's pure blood and he can hardly stand a cauldron to weigh up. Now notice that. Ron talks about, you know, the Malfoys who think of themselves as being so much better because they're pure blood. But listen to what Hagrid again said about the Malfoys. Rotten to the core. Bad blood. Is there really any difference between what Hagrid says and what the Malfoys think? That is, Hagrid thinks that some people are better than others merely on the basis of their blood. Or maybe I should put it this way, that some people are worse than others because of their blood. Ron goes on. It's a disgusting thing to call someone. Dirty blood, see? Common blood. It's ridiculous. Most wizards these days are half blood anyway. If we hadn't married muggles, we'd have died out. Okay? Notice that. They're half blood. You, you don't have a term of half blood without first having some notion of purity. Okay? Hagrid says, you know, I don't blame you for trying to curse him and such. So they go on, and Harry's off doing something in the next chapter. He comes in from Quidditch practice, um, and Filch captures him, grabs him. He sees all the mess and muck everywhere, as he says it, 
on page 125, and he takes Harry to his office. And he's going he's gonna to really get Harry in trouble this time. And while Harry is there, they hear a loud noise in the room up above them. Filch leaves, and Harry notices an envelope on Filch's desk. And he opens it and finds out Filch is a squib. Filch comes in, thinks Harry's looked in the envelope, tells Harry to leave and not tell anybody. Harry leaves and runs into nearly headless Nick. And Nick invites Harry to his 500th death day party. All right. So they go to the 500th death day party, which is on Halloween. This is on page 133, which is on Halloween. And we find out that Sir Nicholas de Mimsey Porpenton died October 31st, 1492. And because it's the 500th anniversary of his death, we now know that the year that this takes place is 1992. Okay? Harry is now 12, so Harry was born in 1980. So his parents died October 31st, 1981. They run into to Moni Myrtle and talk with her a bit. Ron says some... Uh, infelicitous things that angers her. Harry tries to make uh, Patrick Podmore accept Nick into the Headless Nut Hunt, which of course he won't. And then as they're leaving, Harry hears on page 137 a voice, Rip, tear, kill. And Harry's like, what, what is that? It's the same voice he heard when he was in Lockhart's office. So hungry for so long. Kill. Time to kill. And he hears smell blood. And Harry starts running up the stairs. Page 138. They go to a hallway. And they see in this hallway. Bottom of 138. Foot-high words have been daubed in the wall between two windows, shimmering in the light cast by the flaming torches. The chamber of secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air, beware. And they see something hanging under the words. And it turns out to be Mrs. Norris, Filch's cat, tied by her tail from a torch bracket. Ron says, let's get out of here. Harry, shouldn't we try and help? Ron, trust me, we don't want to be found here. Now notice that. Harry's first inclination is, shouldn't we try to help? Mrs. Norris, in the previous chapter, got Harry in trouble. She was the one who saw him, that, and then she drew Filch to him. If you remember back in... Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. When Harry was off in the Forbidden Forest with Malfoy and they came up to the wounded centaur, as they're making their way forward, Harry reaches his arm out and he stops Malfoy. Now, he doesn't like Malfoy at that point. Actually, he probably hates him. And yet, without thinking, he reaches his arm out to stop him. He's trying to protect him. Rowling is showing us some aspect of, of Harry's character that way, his, his inner nature. He protects Malfoy. He tries to help Dobby. Here, he wants to help Mrs. Norris. Ron says, Harry, we need to get out of here fast. They don't. They get caught. And... They get taken up to uh, Lockhart's office along with Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Snape, and Lockhart, and Filch. Dumbledore is able to determine what's happened to her, that she's been petrified. He says, but, you know, there are mandrakes, and when the mandrakes are ready, we'll be able to make the anti-petrification um, potion that will bring her back. So we're going to skip a bunch more again. 
And Hermione's been looking for a history of Hogwarts because she knows she's read something about this Chamber of Secrets. So in the chapter of the writing on the wall, page 149, they go to Professor of, uh, they go to History of Magic, which is taught, remember, by Professor Benz, who is a ghost. We're told, I think, in the first book, one day he went to the staff, staff room, sat down by the fire, fell asleep and died, woke up the next morning, went off to teach his class, not realizing kind of that he was dead, but he is dead. And so in the history of magic, Hermione asks, can you tell us anything about the Chamber of Secrets? And he says, my subject is history of magic. I deal with facts, Miss Granger, not myths and legends. But she presses him, and so he goes on and tells them the legend about the Chamber of Secrets. And then on page 152, Professor Benz says, Just because a wizard doesn't use dark magic doesn't mean he can't miss Penny Feather. I repeat, if the likes of Dumbledore, he goes on, It is a myth. It does not exist. There is not a shred of evidence that Slytherin ever built so much as a secret broom cupboard. Okay? He talks about the castle having been searched, etc. Okay. So we go on more. And on page 155 and 154, they go to the hallway where they saw the letters written on the wall, and they notice the spiders are acting strangely. And Ron backs away from the spiders. And Ron tells them why. When I was three, Fred turned my, my teddy bear into a great big filthy spider because I broke his toy broomstick. That's that inconsistency I've repeatedly mentioned. They're not supposed to be able to do any kind of transformation, transfiguration magic, one without a wand and two without training and classes. That's why they have to take transfiguration every year at Hogwarts. And notice how hard it is in the first year to transfigure the things they're working on in class. And here, Fred, at the age of four or five, can turn Ron's teddy bear into a great big giant living spider with its legs moving? Just doesn't make sense. So they go into the bathroom and they talk with Moaning Myrtle. Ron see, uh, excuse me, Percy sees them coming out. And they keep talking and Hermione says, you know, we could figure out, figure out if Malfoy is the heir of Salazar Slytherin, if we had some Polyjuice Potion. Next chapter, The Rogue Bludger. We're going to skip quite a bit. We see in the Quidditch match that the Bludger keeps going after Harry. And Oliver Wood said, you know, that Harry, you got to win this game or die trying. And so Harry says, I'm going to, I'll take on the Bludger. Don't worry about me. The bludger hits him, breaks his arm. Harry catches the golden snitch just in time. Uh, kind of crashes on the ground. Lockhart shows up and says he's going to fix his arm for him. Does some magic. And the only problem is, bottom of 173, Lockhart hadn't mended Harry's bones. He had removed them. Harry goes to the hospital wing to see Mrs. Pumphrey. Okay. While in there... What do we see happen? Two things. One, Dobby reappears. And then two, after Dobby disappears again, Dumbledore and McGonagall bring another victim up. Another person has been petrified. So first, Dobby. Bottom of 176 and through 179. Dobby shows up. And Harry learns that it was Dobby that kept them from going through the gate at platform nine and three quarters, or at King's Cross. That it was Dobby who put the hex on the bludger. And on page 177, 